to see you all in this space. How many of you have been to the Missing Soldiers Office before? Show of hands. All right, so welcome back. For those of you who haven't been here before, welcome for the first time. Uh, this is the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum. Uh, this museum is a unique partnership, uh, kind of a three-part partnership between the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, which is headquartered in Frederick, Maryland. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are working with the General Services Administration, the GSA, uh, who controls the preservation easement on this building. Um, and we also, the building is owned by a private developer. Uh, so we have an interesting partnership going on there. Uh, this space itself, the room you're sitting in, is the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office itself. Uh, between 1865 and 1868, Clara Barton and a team of clerks work in this room to search for Union soldiers who went missing during the Civil War. Uh, in the time before official government identification, dog tags, many soldiers, both North and South, go into battle and disappear forever, to be buried in unknown graves. Uh, and so Clara Barton realizes this need in 1865 and gets approval from Abraham Lincoln to start this work. And so for the next three years of her life, after volunteering and working on Civil War battlefields, Barton and her team worked here and eventually discovered the fate of more than 22,000 missing Union soldiers. Uh, it's really the forgotten story of Barton's life. We all remember her as the angel of the battlefield, the Civil War nurse, or the founder of the American Red Cross. This museum tells the story, the important story of what happened in between, because without the experience Barton gains here, uh, in terms of running an organization, in terms of administrating an organization, in terms of fundraising, in terms of the importance of a humanitarian going out and assisting others, she does not go on to found the American Red Cross. Uh, and Barton, as you'll see tonight, is tied into many of the social issues of the time, uh, one of the most important being the suffrage movement. So I like to think that Clara Barton, uh, she's looking down on us right now, we're probably pretty excited about this conversation that's going on. Uh, looking at a little bit about her legacy and when it comes to the suffrage movement in the immediate aftermath, Civil War, but also in talking about, very important as we're going through the 100th anniversary of World War I, as we approach uh, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, that we talk about how the Civil War and World War I, um, how they kind of got together, how they compare and contrast when it comes to the suffrage movement. So, uh, my name is Jake Wynn. I am the Director of Interpretation here at the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office, and I will be uh, one part of your guide through this evening. Kelsey introduce herself. Hi everybody, thanks for being here tonight. Um, so again, my name is Kelsey Malay and I'm the Interpretation and Digital Media Manager at the National Women's Party. Um, and the National Women's Party today is a nonprofit partner at the Belmont Hall Women's Equality National Monument. It is a beautiful historic house on Capitol Hill right on 2nd and Constitution Northeast. Has anyone been to Belmont Hall before? Excellent, wonderful. And to all of you who haven't, make that next on your list. Always love getting new people over there. Um, so it's open to the public Wednesday through Sunday, 9 to 5. Um, and we also um, you know, welcome, uh, I'll give you my card if you'd like. We'd love to um, have you make an appointment to come in and I can show you around a little bit. Um, and so today we you know, work still out of the Belmont Hall Women's Equality National Monument. That historic house became our headquarters in 1929 after the suffrage movement. It became our fifth and final headquarters. Um, and we've stayed there to this day. Um, when the house was designated a national monument in 2016, we started a really wonderful full par partnership with the National Park Service. Um, so today, the National Park Service owns the house and we still own our collection um, and we work with them on the exhibits at the site um, and we do a lot of public programs and partner programs such as this um, and traveling exhibitions. And um, one of the things we're very excited now is, as Jake mentioned, um, the centennial of the 19th Amendment is fast approaching. Um, we will start marking, act marking it in uh, June 2019 when Congress first passed the amendment, and then uh, it'll all culminate in August 2020 when it was finally ratified by enough states and signed into law. Um, so that's a big thing that's coming up on our end. Now we were founded all the way back in 1913, uh, originally as a lobbying organization fighting for the right to vote, women's right to vote, um, and particularly we focused on getting a federal suffrage amendment passed to the U.S. Constitution. Um, by the time Alice Paul, our founder, uh, founded the National Women's Party in 1913, the American 
American suffrage movement had become very focused on state-by-state -state passage of women's suffrage. Uh, and then this younger generation, Alice Paul and members of the National Women's Party came in and said, this is moving way too slowly. We need to put attention back on a federal suffrage amendment. Um, so they formed their own organization, the NWP, in 1913, um, kind of put momentum back behind that campaign for an amendment to the US Constitution. Um, and one of the tactics that the NWP was most iconic for at the time was their pickets outside the White House. So the National Women's Party started picketing outside the White House in January 1917. Uh, fun fact, they were the first organization to ever picket outside the White House, which some of you may know that, but it's certainly not well known enough considering how much a part of American politics that is today. They were the first organization um, ever to do that. And um, that is why our presentation today is called Banners Instead of Guns, Fighting for Suffrage in Wartime. Um, the National Women's Party was very well known for uh, their silent sentinels, as they called them, the women who stood outside the White House gates, silently holding banners that did their talking for them. Uh, and so that quote, Banners Instead of Guns, comes from this quote from Alice Paul. When men are denied justice, they go to war. This is our war, only we are fighting it with banners instead of guns. Um, and the great photo there of Alice Paul looking like she's ready to go into battle. Um, so, at the beginning of the suffrage movement and all the way through uh, to the time the 19th Amendment was passed, uh, suffragists really viewed the vote as a vehicle for other change. Um, in particular, the suffrage movement really stemmed out of the abolition movement. Um, so you had women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, and Lucretia Mott who were very passionate abolitionists and very involved in that movement. Um, and this event, for example, really, really catalyzed those women uh, to start focusing on women's right to vote. Uh, the World Anti-Slavery Convention of 1840 uh, held in London. Uh, a lot of women went to attend um, attend that convention, women who were involved in the abolition movement, and the women who were there were asked to sit behind a curtain and listen to the convention as the men spoke. Um, and a lot of these women, I mean, like in a lot of movements, women were the main organizers of the movement. Um, and so then they were asked to sit behind a curtain and listen instead of being part of the conversation. And so issues like abolition, issues like the temperance movement, these different social issues that um, women were involved in and leading at the time um, then turned their attention to women's right to vote because they realized no one's listening to us if we aren't voting constituents. Um, so this really moves uh, these women into fighting for suffrage um, and leads to the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, which was the first women's rights convention in the United States um, organized in large part by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, and it, out of this convention came the Declaration of Sentiments. So on the left there, you see the image of, kind of the list of people who signed the Declaration of Sentiments, which was uh, based off of the Declaration of Independence. It stated that all men and women are created equal. And it kind of outlined the different rights um, that women did not have and that the, kind of the women who organized this convention viewed it as the, one, the rights that women needed to be fighting for. Um, and uh, so you see this list of names, people who signed it. One of the keynote speakers and signers of the Declaration of, of uh, Sentiments was Frederick Douglass. Um, so that once again shows these ties between people who were fighting for abolition and people who were fighting for women's rights, um, and particularly women's right to vote. Uh, interestingly, the right to vote was the only list on these sentiments that did not pass unanimously. Um, so there were other rights like property rights, um, kind of legal identity and kind of citizenship and you know not being viewed as the property of your father or your husband. Things like that um, passed unanim unanimously and the right to vote was viewed as so controversial they thought it might hurt the cause um, for other rights if they added that to the list. Um, it did pass, uh, but it was the only one that was not unanimous. In 1922, you see on the right, um, the Declaration of Principles. This is what the National Women's Party published um, after the 19th Amendment passed in 1920. And they viewed this as kind of the next list for the next phase of the women's movement. Um, there were a lot of similar things on the list, like still property rights, still kind of citizenship, for example. Until 1922, 
uh, American women lost their citizenship if they married a foreigner. They didn't take on their husband's citizen citizenship, they just became stateless. So that was kind of one of the things they were trying to change. Um, and so this, again, kind of exemplifies the fact that uh, these suffragists were not fighting just to have the vote, but to use the vote to create other change. Um, and so again, out of the Declaration of Sentiments, we get this idea that all men and women are created equal. Um, but another aspect of the suffrage movement was that it was very racially segregated, um, and a lot of white suffragists um, didn't want it to be too integrated because they were, again, afraid that um, the movement might lose support. So you have this great quote from Mary Church Terrell, who was founder of the National Association of Colored Women. She was a member of uh, the organization National American Women's Suffrage Association, and she also picketed and protested with the National Women's Party. Um, and she said, the, the elected franchise is withheld from one half of its citizens because the word people, by an unparalleled exhibition of lexic lexicographical acrobatics, has been turned and twisted to mean all who are shrewd and wise enough to have themselves born boys instead of girls, or who took the trouble to be born white instead of black. Um, so this was you know, kind of a blind spot in the suffrage movement as well. Uh, a lot of white suffragists were very focused on um, kind of getting the right to vote for women, but what they really meant was for white women, and um, tended to overlook the other obstacles that women of color faced. Um, which again is captured in this quote um, by Frances Harper, uh, an abolitionist and suffragist, who said, as much as white women need the ballot, colored women need it more. Um, and so here we see, in 1917, the National Women's Party with the, some of their picket banners, um, and this really reflects how they were looking to the example of the suffrage movement during the Civil War um, to influence their um, tactics and strategies in the later suffrage movement in the early 20th century. Um, so this banner on the left says, Lincoln stood for women's suffrage 60 years ago. Mr. President, talking about President Wilson, you blocked the suffrage amendment today. Why are you behind Lincoln? So why are you like 60 years behind the times? Um, and so again, they often used the name and image of Lincoln um, as a way to kind of inspire people to support the suffrage amendment. Um, and they also looked to the, to the Civil War to say, you know, just because we're at war again in World War I does not mean we should slow down the suffrage movement. Um, during the Civil War, uh, a lot of suffrage leaders kind of put the cause on hold, focused on the war effort, um, and you know, 70 years later, women were still fighting for the right to vote. Um, so this other banner to the right says, after the Civil War, uh, women were asked to um, kind of put the cause on hold, uh, they were told to wait their turn, and we're not going to do that again. Um, and they specifically reference the idea of the 15th Amendment, which passed in 1870, and gave African American men the right to vote. Um, there was really a split in the movement at that point between kind of people who were fighting for uh, racial equality and um, kind of people of color and their right to vote, and white suffragists um, who you know, thought that women should be included in that amendment. Uh, women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony did not support passage of the 15th Amendment unless it included women. Um, and again, you know, there were women such as, um, you know, Sojourner Truth who said, you know, we have these kind of dual uh, forms of oppression and the 15th Amendment will help us make progress forward. Um, and I know Clara Barton was a supporter of the 15th Amendment. Yeah, so the really the, um, just going back a little bit and kind of see that Clara Barton comes of age amidst this movement. Um, she is uh, born in Massachusetts in 1821, uh, and so she is, you know, coming into her own as a teacher, initially her first career, as this movement is really getting started, um, and becomes one of the pioneering federal, employ uh, pioneering, uh, federal employees, who, one of the first like, the woman, women to work uh, within the federal workforce. Uh, in the 1850s. Uh, and so she is kind of growing up amidst this and seeing this uh, movement change. Uh, and her experience in the Civil War is really kind of important in how she views the suffrage movement and also specifically the 15th Amendment. Uh, Clara Barton first goes to the battlefield in 1862. Um, by 1863, after her experience at places like Antietam and Fredericksburg nursing on the battlefield, she actually goes south to South Carolina to the Sea Islands, 
uh, where there are large numbers of free people who have liberated themselves from slavery and gone into union lines, uh, so-called contrabands. Um, and so Barton is there helping them in the midst of a smallpox epidemic, and also nursing uh, some of the first uh, black troops who went into, into battle. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Glory? Uh, the end scene where the 54th Massachusetts uh, first black men see major combat operations during the war uh, in July 1863. She's there on the battlefield as wounded soldiers are coming off and assisting those, those wounded soldiers. And so she is seeing this battle, this fight going on, not only between black men in uniform, uh, but also these, these black communities who are first, for the first time experiencing freedom. And so she sees the horrors of slavery. And so this really, uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War, as Reconstruction begins, she sees the need for, uh, for black, the black vote first. Um, and this is going to be one of, uh, this is gonna be one of her first arguments. Uh, she will kind of, through her career, have kind of, um, kind of some stats within the suffrage movement. Um, but this is really the first time that she has kind of, uh, in, is involved in this split over the 15th Amendment. Uh, because she believes that in order to protect themselves, black men should have the right to vote. Um, because the best protection for them is franchise, is to actually have the ability to have a say in politics. And so she um, very famously addresses a, um, in 1869, um, an equal rights convention. Um, she gets up and she explains her support for, uh, for the 15th Amendment. Um, essentially saying that uh, the black men should get it first and women get it next. We're, we're the next in line. This is a time of freedom. And at that time, with radical reconstruction, it did appear that there was an opening door uh, for, for people of, of, of all color, of all, uh, of all sex, um, to get opportunities uh, for more rights. Um, of course, that door is going to be slammed shut in the 1870s. Um, but at that time, it looked like there was a great opportunity. However, it was very divisive, her saying this. Um, and so she begins to get some pushback uh, about that view. Um, and so she ends up writing to a friend um, in, in the aftermath of this speech and some of the pushback that she gets. Um, she writes, uh, explaining her position, uh, quote, I only meant to be understood like this. No person in that house would or could be more rejoiced than I to see the franchise bestowed upon every person capable of using it without regard to race, color, or sex. But if the door was not wide enough for all at once, and one must wait, or all must wait, then I for one was willing that the old scarred slave limp through before me. I had no heart to pull or thrust him back in spite because he was already in advance of me. Heaven knows I have no desire to degrade my sex. So her arguments there kind of lead into some of the arguments that are going to take place in the Reconstruction era, but also as the suffrage movement moves in towards the 20th century. And so, uh, speaking of women getting pushed back for the stances that they were taking at this time, um, loyalty to the cause. This is a big question that suffragists during the Civil War and during World War I um, had to ask themselves. Do we continue fighting for suffrage while um, our country is at risk of being torn apart or you know, while we're sending our sons off to fight for democracy abroad? Um, and so during the Civil War, um, the popular opinion was to kind of step back on the fight for women's suffrage, um, focus on supporting the war effort, focused on trying to be a unified country. Um, and during World War I, uh, the National Women's Party in particular said, we're still gonna focus on suffrage and suffrage first. That is why we exist, and um, the very fact that we're at war is more reason that women need to have a vote. Um, even in Britain, which was known to be a much more kind of militant and aggressive uh, suffrage movement, you have the leader of the movement over there, Emmeline Pankhurst, saying, we're gonna choose to kind of put the cause on hold um, while we are at war. And she says, what's the use of having a vote if there's no country to vote in? Now during World War I, um, you know, the United States isn't facing the same kind of existential pressure um, that they're facing in Britain, uh, but a lot of uh, suffragists decide to put kind of war work alongside their efforts 
for suffrage. Um, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, for example, allows their members to do war work under the banner of NASA uh, for short. Uh, but the National Women's Party does not allow anyone to do work for the war under the NWP banner. They are still suffrage and suffrage first. Um, and so part of this is an honor to some of their heroines, again, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, um, who were kind of some of very few suffragists during the Civil War who kind of continued to elevate the discussion of women's suffrage during wartime. And this was a pamphlet that the National Women's Party published in 1917. Again, they start um, picketing outside the White House in January 1917. Once the United States enter, enters World War I in April 1917, these pickets become much more controversial. People view it as unpatriotic or even treasonous to be bothering the president with this issue during wartime and distracting from the war effort. Um, and they published this pamphlet explaining why they think they still need to be picketing and putting suffrage above these other issues. Um, and it's a few things. They don't want to lose momentum like happened during the Civil War. Um, you know, 70 years later, women are still fighting for the right to vote. They thought they would have kind of earned the respect um, of politicians and leaders and of male voters from supporting the war effort during the Civil War and would be given the right to vote at that time. And of course, that did not happen. Um, the National Women's Party also said, again, now more than ever that we've decided to enter this war, women need to have a voice in what the government decides to do. Um, and they also were very focused on highlighting the, the hypocrisy of fighting for democracy abroad while we really didn't have democracy back home. Um, oh, I love that quote actually. So this is a quote from Why We Pick It. Nothing could be more sorrowful, sorrowful at a time of national danger than to see the suffrage banners lowered. And so democracy begins at home. Uh, this is an example of the rhetoric that the National Women's Party was using um, once we entered the war. Um, again, they had banners that just quoted directly from President Wilson. This is a huge banner with a quote from his war message to Congress in April 1917, um, quoting him saying, we shall fight for the things which we hold, uh, which we carry nearest in our hearts for democracy. Um, and so, you know, they, a lot of the times they're just holding Wilson's own words outside the White House gates, but it's really highlighting the fact that, hey, half the population is not allowed to vote. Um, and then they also had banners, again, pointing out the fact that women need to vote now more than ever since we are at war. Mr. President, it is unjust to deny women a voice in their government when the government is conscripting their sons. Uh, this was a very controversial banner, yeah. <laughs> uh, calling President Wilson Kaiser Wilson. Um, so they got a lot of flack for this one. Um, they were basically attacked when they held um, this fair in 1917. They were chased back to their headquarters. This banner was ripped apart, um, and someone actually fired a shot um, in, uh, through their window of their headquarters. And this is the one little piece of a Kaiser Wilson banner that still exists today. Um, so oftentimes when they were picketing, um, especially after they uh, after we entered the war, uh, men would tear down um, their banners and rip them up. Um, sometimes the women would kind of hide additional banners under their skirts and just whip them out. Um, <laughs> but like they were constantly having their banners destroyed, and so they were turning out these banners nonstop. Um, and so another uh, kind of tactic and rhetoric that the National Women's Party was using at the time was pointing out the fact that um, other countries were passing suffrage kind of as a war measure and trying to persuade um, the president to take the stance and convince con Congress to do the same. So this is a headline that says, England and Russia are enfranchising women in wartime. Um, and uh, this is an example, again, of the National Women's Party using Abraham Lincoln's imagery um, on, uh, kind of on their materials. This is a cover of The Suffragist, which was the National Women's Party's uh, weekly newsletter during the suffrage movement, um, when the National Women's Party was fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment and other issues throughout the 20th century. Um, this uh, publication was called Equal Rights. Um, but this, uh, this cover has a quote um, saying, you know, you can only fool half the country. What, what is the quote again? You can't fool. You can only fool half of the country at a time. You can't fool everybody at once. Yeah. So basically, again, saying it shows Uncle Sam trumpeting for democracy abroad, and um, you know you can't fool the country into thinking we have full democracy here. Um, so this really ties into the fact that um, 
the National Women's Party was very um, savvy with the press and with their messaging and controlling the narrative, which um, also ties into Clara Barton as well. Yes, so one of the, one of the uh, I would say, one of the first women that was really, really invested in controlling her own image and controlling her own narrative is Clara Barton. Um, going back to her days as an educator, uh, Barton finds success. She finds success as an educator, as a teacher in uh, both Massachusetts and New Jersey. In both cases, she's going to find problems, though, where she is going to be constantly running up against the fact that all of these things are being administrated by men. Um, and so she is not unable to control her own narrative in those schools. Uh, very famously, in her Bordentown school in New Jersey, uh, she is replaced uh, as principal by a male principal after she was out sick. She's out with laryngitis, comes back to find that she had been replaced. So she comes to Washington. She comes to Washington and begins working at the United States Patent Office. And she does that, she's making the same amount of money as her male counterparts in the early 1850s, which is pretty remarkable. She's working in an integrated office, men and women working alongside one another. Uh, that was pretty radical. Uh, with the election of a very conservative Democrat, uh, James Buchanan, in 1856, she's driven out. And all the other women working in the federal workforce are driven out. Again, she can't control her own story. She can't control her own narrative. She can't even go on working in the same job. The Civil War opens a door for her, as it does for many, for many women. Um, and so she is able to go out, after fighting for more than a year, able to go out onto the battlefield and make a name for herself. The, the first time that Clara Barton's name is published in the national press is in the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam, September of 1862, the bloodiest day in American history. Barton is on the battlefield nursing in a field hospital. One of the surgeons that is working in that hospital uh, writes a letter in the months afterwards um, and says essentially that she is the true heroine of the age. Uh, Clara Barton is the angel of the battlefield. And so Barton's first taste of the national press was a very good one. She becomes known as the angel of the battlefield. However, a couple of years later, when she begins to open this missing soldier's office, she really begins to grapple with controlling her narrative in a press that isn't always so friendly. Um, and so Barton, in starting this office, the missing soldier's office in 1865, is fronting all of the money herself. Uh, she is not uh, getting any money from the federal government. She is required to go out and fundraise for herself. She is asking the federal government for $15,000 to keep this operation going. Uh, but in the first year of this operation, she's out by herself. She's on her own, fundraising, uh, relying on friends and family to, to, to give her money uh, to keep this operation going to find these missing Union soldiers. Um, she is in that, uh, getting that $15,000 proves to be very problematic. Uh, this is where she is again going to run into pushback because she is a woman trying to do this operation on her own, trying to lead an office that is going to get $15,000 from the federal government. And so this is going to be her first taste of bad press, and she doesn't like it, not one bit. Um, around the same time, she has a, a series of photographs taken of her. Uh, if you're all familiar with Matthew Brady, um, very famous photographer, takes some photographs of Clara Barton. An example of one of them is over there under the first aid practitioner, educator, and advocate. Um, that is one of a series of photos that, uh, that remain from that photo shoot. Uh, there were several photos taken, probably in excess of 10 photographs taken. Um, she smashed all of the plates she didn't like. <laughs> She's literally controlling her image. But when it comes to the press, this is where uh, what's written about her in newspapers, this is where she really runs into to problems because as she's asking for this $15,000, she is getting serious pushback. Uh, I have one quote here from a newspaper article written uh, from New England. She's a native New Englander, so I'm sure this was particularly galling to her. Uh, quote, she has made a very profitable thing out of her speculation and traded upon her patriotism to a good purpose. The business in which she engaged was unauthorized and she had no claim upon the government for services or anything else. The very men who voted to give a woman $15,000 for doing nothing for the government will no doubt haggle a month over ensuring bounties were paid out to brave men who offered themselves in the defense of our country. I think she would contend that she was doing quite a bit more than nothing 
for the government, should, filling a role that the government decided it did not want to have in informing families of what happened to their missing loved ones. What this did though, for the rest of Barton's life, from this point forward, from 1865 and 1866, is that she begins to plant her own stories, control her own narrative. Um, stories about the missing soldier's office, a very famous one by a friend named Francis Gage, tells the story of this office and of Barton's work with Andersonville, the very famous prison in, in Georgia, uh, that Barton went on an expedition to, uh, to help identify the, the dead there at Andersonville uh, Cemetery. Uh, Barton begins to recognize that she can control this narrative by planting these stories, by putting herself in new positions, by giving speeches to, uh, to suffrage gatherings, for other gatherings, uh, specifically of soldiers. Uh, one of the things that she's going to do for the suffrage movement specifically is that in the 1870s and the 1880s, she will go and speak of her wartime experience. She'll speak of what she did during the Civil War, and she will speak of how women helped soldiers and how they deserve recompense for that work, and that that recompense had not come uh, with the vote, and that um, basically that, that what women did during the Civil War with that war work deserved to be repaid with the vote. Um, and so she is advocating that throughout and controlling, again, her own narrative um, by going out, giving these speeches, planting stories in the press, uh, sometimes telling stories that go a little over the top. Um, but, but she has an understanding of this narrative. And so this is the same sort of thing that other women and organizations are going to be able to start picking up as we get into the 20th century, and specifically when we get around World War I. Yeah, um, so the National Women's Party was also very focused on taking control of the story of the suffrage movement and taking control of their own image. Um, so that's, again, one thing that they did with their weekly newsletter, the suffragists. Um, they had a, an official political cartoonist of the National Women's Party. Her name was Nina Allender. Um, she actually studied at the Corcoran School of Art. Um, and she wanted to be a painter, but then our founder, Alice Paul, kind of persuaded her, she's a very persuasive person, um, persuaded her to just start drawing political cartoons for the NWP, which she then did for the next 14 years. Um, so one way they kind of took control of the image of suffragists, which anti-suffrage propaganda always depicted um, suffragists as masculine, as violent, um, as out of control, and so with these political cartoons, uh, the National Women's Party was representing suffragists at, as these young, um, attractive, stylish, um, and kind of intelligent, and uh, very in control um, women. Um, so they were, in a way, kind of using their femininity to say, you know, just having the vote isn't going to make us not women anymore, because that was another big fear uh, of the kind of anti-suffrage side. Um, and they also were, um, in a lot of their political cartoons, basing them off of World War I propaganda. Um, so a lot of, you know, you see a lot of Uncle Sam, um, and you see also just a lot of war imagery. Um, here you see a soldier um, kind of attacking a picket outside of the White House and the police just standing by. Um, and so through these political cartoons and through the articles that they were writing in The Suffragist, they were really able to uh, use their own voice to represent the work that they were doing and what was happening in the movement. Um, and they were also very good at, with these big, bold tactics that they would use, the pickets outside the White House, the marches down Pennsylvania Avenue, um, and kind of putting themselves in the limelight and getting themselves arrested and sent to prison, um, which happened kind of once we entered World War I, as they continued picketing outside the White House, they were arrested for obstructing sidewalk traffic. Um, you know, they kept pushing the envelope and keeping suffrage in the headlines, which helped to build momentum that would lead to the 19th Amendment passing in 1920. Um, and so this is a close-up of one of the political cartoons, um, another quote from President Wilson that says, we proudly claim to be the champions of democracy. If we really are in deeds and truth, let us see to it that we do not discredit our own. Um, which I think is a very important quote because, again, they're trying to highlight this hypocrisy of fighting for suffrage abroad, when, or sorry, fighting for democracy abroad when we didn't have democracy back home. But I also think it's a really interesting quote in shedding light on you know, kind of what were the blind spots of within the suffrage movement itself. What are the blind spots of the fight for equality still today? 
Um, today in the movement, we talk a lot about intersectionality and how women are not just women. Um, and when we say, when we talk about women first, that's usually kind of white women who are overseeing the other issues that women face. Um, and so as we're kind of moving into 2020 and celebrating 100 years of the 19th Amendment, a big part of the conversation um, is going to be, you know, it's not just going to be a celebration. It's going to be talking about what were the kind of failings of the 19th Amendment? What was the work that had yet to be done after the 19th Amendment passed? Um, you know, women of color really didn't establish their right to vote um, until the Voting Rights Act of 1965, because as we saw after the 15th Amendment, um, states were able to obstruct black men from voting and were able to do the same after the 19th Amendment uh, with black women. Um, so yeah, it's really exciting with the centennial coming up. We're going to have a lot of great activities. We're going to have traveling exhibitions, uh, panel discussions, great partner programs like this. Um, and you know, a big part of the conversation is going to be what happened after the 19th Amendment, what work still needed to be done, um, and even what is kind of the unfinished business of women's equality even today. Um, and so love this imagery, um, kind of side by side, the March 3rd, 1913 <laughs> suffrage procession down Pennsylvania Avenue with the Capitol in the background, and then the 2017 Women's March today, um, just kind of depicting the fact that women are still uh, using signs and banners to fight for equal rights. Um, and so, yeah, the, the journey continues. So with that, we will open up for any questions, comments that you guys might have about uh, anything here or in the presentation you would love to hear. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so, and it, I don't like to read all that well, but you, you mentioned that Russia and, and England went ahead and gave women the right to vote during World War I. What was the... How were they able to get that? What was the rationale um, at, at that point? And then were women able to build on that rationale? Mm -hmm. um, so I think in, in those other countries, the idea was that it would kind of bring about a more kind of unified front um, of their voters and also kind of rewarding women for their support of the war effort in those countries which again was kind of the argument that uh, women were trying to make in the United States. Um, so I think in, with all of the upheaval of the war, trying to bring citizens together um, and to show kind of appreciation for, for the work that women were doing. Yeah, and just one comment on that. So in 1917, led to the other conversation of, in the United States, people being wary of communism. Um, and so that was when the National Women's Party would bring up Russia passing suffrage for women, that kind of complicated their argument. <laughs> discrimination, not, not 
a separate category, or was there some kind of legal difference that they faced? No, I, they faced kind of the same suppression of their vote after the 19th Amendment passed, which was why um, within the movement, women of color uh, like Mary Church Terrell, like Ida B. Wells, um, some of the you know, African American women who were involved in the suffrage movement were really trying to get their white sisters to address the fact that um, you know, just this suffrage amendment, uh, this amendment that said women could vote wasn't going to, in practice, allow women of color to vote. Um, and even after the 19th Amendment passed, um, there's uh, a quote from Mary Church Terrell. She's talking about a conversation she had with Alice Paul, the founder of the National Women's Party, where um, she kind of went to Alice Paul saying, now that the 19th Amendment has passed, you know, I think the National Women's Party should turn their attention to ensuring that um, women of color's right to vote is not suppressed. And Alice Paul said, um, you know, our organization is focused solely on sex discrimination. We don't want to confuse things by also focusing on race discrimination. So again, it's like we have this conversation about intersection, intersectionality today, um, and clearly, um, you know, they didn't have that language back then, and they that certainly wasn't something that the movement was practicing. Um, so yeah, it, the kind of same um, issues that came about with the 15th Amendment came about with the 19th Amendment for women of color. Yes? Um, the exercising their right to vote, um, but there wasn't as much focus, I think, on, um, in general, in, in state by state, uh, trying to suppress women's right to vote um, after the fact of the 19th <coughs> Amendment. Um, but, you know, these other issues like um, serving on juries and property rights and citizen, citizenship, um, again, there was a lot of work to still be done after the 19th Amendment passed. And, Organizations like the National Women's Party wanted to make sure that the movement did not lose momentum after the 19th Amendment passed because the vote was meant to just be this vehicle to make other change for women. And so one of the first things that the National Women's Party did, Alice Paul um, drafted the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923. Um, that was a big part of uh, what the National Women's Party was focused on in the 20th century, and um, it finally passed in Congress in 1972. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with with what happens next, it uh, then was never ratified because there was this uh, aggressive campaign against it. Um, and Congress had set a deadline of 1982 for the states to ratify it. Um, and so actually in 2017, Nevada um, ratified the Equal Rights Amendment and this year, Illinois ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. So today we're only one state shy of, of the ERA passing, but because that deadline in 1982 passed so long ago, if another state ratifies, it'll still be kind of an open question. So anyway, all of that is to say, um, you know, after the 19th Amendment passed, uh, suffragists thought there was a lot of work still to be done for women to have full equality, and you know, there's still a lot of work to be done today. Yes? What was uh, the president's position on women's suffrage, which or was it? You want to no, take it? <laughs> um, uh, so to begin with, uh, it should be decided by the states. That was his stance for a long time. Um, and then, you know, with these organizations kind of working on him for a while, you know, National American Women's Suffrage Association was having a lot of meetings with him. The NWP was calling him out in public nonstop. Um, he actually started to kind of come out in support of a federal suffrage amendment in January 1918. Um, so that was after the pickets outside the White House, the National Women's Party members going to prison um, for obstructing sidewalk traffic, um, and then they were actually, you know, they went on hunger strikes in prison to protest the treatment they were receiving and were force fed in prison, um, having tubes shoved up their noses and down their throats and usually brought eggs poured into their stomachs. Um, so very brutal process, but anyway, word got out that that was happening, and that 
really started to build this wave of public sympathy for the suffragists and sort of started to change the tides and change momentum towards uh, the amendment passing. So, so President Wilson, at first it was, you know, it's the state's decisions, but he then kind of in 1918 started to come out and support the amendment. I wanted to say too, just to add a little bit to that, I mean, there definitely, you can see it with, with the signs, and of course, Kaiser Wilson is pretty much a, a thumb in the eye, but <laughs> also with the references to Lincoln, um, because of uh, Wilson being from Virginia, uh, being born, you know, in Virginia at the time of the Civil War, and growing up in that in that time period, sixty years behind Lincoln, that kind of that kind of uh, conversation. This is a guy who's you know screening movies about the Ku Klux Klan in the White House. Mm -hmm. um, you know this that kind of imagery and that kind of uh, language towards him, I can't imagine uh, made him feel great. <laughs> so I can imagine that, you know, being uh, being a kind of thorn in his side, in addition to all of the other things that they were doing, mm -hmm. um, just that language in particular, in particular was galling. Yeah. Yes, do you know how many states had already given women the right to vote? I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but a lot of states out west were giving women the right to vote. Wyoming. state where women actually exercised their right to vote. Um, and so yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of the Western states had given women the right to vote in their state um, before the 19th Amendment passed. And some states were passing full suffrage for women, some states were allowing women to vote in local elections or state elections, but not presidential elections. So they were sort of divvying up uh, in some states what they thought women should have a say in.
says that the first woman that was elected to the House of Representatives was Janet Hunt in 1916. Mm -hmm. She was elected before the ratification of the amendment. Yes. Um, so, yeah, even though women were barred from serving, and actually a lot of um, women would um, serve the rest of their late husband's term if their if their husbands passed away. Um, so and so for some reason, uh, you know, Jeanette Rankin was able to get elected, and she wasn't barred from being elected. Um, and uh, I, you know, women could could vote in her state, and um, even though the the federal uh, suffrage amendment had it hadn't passed yet, and not, you know, women were basically not serving in public office. She was able to get elected in 1916. Mm-hmm, yep. Any other questions? Yes? So what, who, what is the last state that has not ratified the Equal Rights Amendment? So there are actually 13, I believe, now, or maybe it's, I forget what the exact number is, but Basically, they need uh, one more state to ratify for, uh, well, it's complicated because that deadline passed, but um, at the time that uh, the amendment passed in Congress in 1972, they needed 38 states to ratify, so you need three-fourths of the states to ratify for the amendment to be signed into law. Uh, so they only need 38 of the 50, so there's like a handful of states it could potentially be. Um, a lot of advocates for the Equal Rights Amendment today think Virginia could potentially be next, um, but there are kind of a few states that um, advocates are really focused on where they see potential for, um, for the Equal Rights Amendment to be ratified today. But again, um, that will then bring up the debate about what does that deadline mean and what does the fact that we have full ratification now actually mean and can it be signed into law? So I, think, I remember reading something that some states were Today, I'm not um, sure. There were states that were mm -hmm. Um Throughout that decade, uh, after the amendment passed in Congress in 72 and the deadline of 1982, five states actually rescinded their ratification during that process. But I'm not sure which state uh, more recently has talked about rescinding. Uh, I'm, but maybe I'm thinking of those. It's possible, though. <laughs> it's certainly possible. So, but, but then more, uh, they might have rescinded theirs, but then more states uh, stepped up, so there's still, we have 37? Yeah, so today we have 37 states that have ratified, but two of those states, again, you know, ratified after the, the deadline of 1982. Okay. But it's bringing up the conversation again. Okay, so if it is, if we get to 38, then they have to reintroduce the bills all over again? I think the question would then go to Congress um, to decide, or, or yeah, there might, there would have to be legislation to um, invalidate the deadline in order for it to be uh, signed into law today, I believe. Um, yes? You said signed into law. Who does, is it after they, if they reset that date and get the, the votes, who else has to go on and sign it? Or is there a so the, <laughs> the executive branch then signs it, but um, it's once it's ratified by the states, it's, um, it's law, and I think the, I th believe signing it at that point is more of a ceremony than something that would be vetoed, I think. Um, yeah, I've never heard of a veto. Yeah. So it would, you know, being signed into law, I think is, it is more of a, um, just a gesture, but once the states ratify it, um, it's law. Yeah. Um, this is a question for you. Uh, would it have Clara Barton um, identified as a suffragist and if she had positioned herself in that way because she took more with the racial side, um, how did that kind of hurt or help her narrative like with the media or in the organizations that she had her hands in? Because um, I mean that was obviously before kind of Alice Paul was really in the movement. So what did that necessarily mean for Clara Barton? Yeah, on the question of whether she'd call herself a suffragist, she was very hesitant. Um, okay. She was kind of towing, towing a very careful line there. Um, but she always was a, a strong advocate for women to the right to vote. I mean, she she very much believed that uh, in the equality of, of, you know, of men and women, of 
people of different colors. She she was very much um, you know interested in furthering those rights. Now the tactics towards doing that, um, she was always very concerned about respectability. Um, she was always that that goes back to uh, her days working on the battlefields of the Civil War. Uh, she was concerned about about certain boundaries um, and about crossing those lines. Um, I think specifically going back to her Civil War experience where uh, she's trying to go out onto the battlefield to, to nurse the wounded and actually goes to her father, uh, who was on his deathbed, uh, a, a man who served in, in the military earlier in his life, um, and basically laid out what she wanted to do, and, uh, and he basically gave the blessing in that, if you think what you're doing is right, then do it. Um, and so, but she was always concerned about that kind of what was respectable um, because she grew up in kind of an upper middle class family. That was always something that was kind of bred into her. Um, and so she was careful um, and, and that carries on through, through her life. Does, is there any known correspondence between her and maybe some of the other more like, yes. well known leaders? Yes, um, and she, she carries on uh, kind of correspondence with Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She, I mean, she, uh, Frederick Douglass, they, they exchange uh, letters. And, and so she is very engaged with the movement, but kind of, uh, again, in a careful sort of way. And that doesn't always, you know, uh, make her popular <laughs> with, yeah. with others in the movement because um, she, she'll find herself in hot water a number of times as a result of, of her statements and, and her beliefs. Um, and again, because of some of this, more of the respectability side. So I think we probably have time for one more question, and then um, if anyone would like to chat after, I would be more than happy to continue the discussion. Are there any other questions? Yes. Could you talk just a little bit about the founding of the Red Cross? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so after Barton leaves, this office and, and goes away from the missing soldiers office in 1868. Um, she, she moves out of here uh, and eventually ends up in Europe. Um, kind of told, it's told by doctors that she needs to take a break. Um, it's, it's almost a decade of her working nonstop. Uh, and so she goes to Europe, um, she makes connections with a family uh, in Switzerland uh, because of one of the men, that, one of the former soldiers in the Union Army that worked here in her office. Uh, she goes to Switzerland, and while she's in Switzerland, she is approached by uh, members of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, they've heard about her. Uh, her reputation preceded her. Um, and so they wanted to know a little bit more about her, and also, you know, trying to open the door towards getting uh, the United States involved in the Red Cross, because it's, a, at that time, a rapidly industrializing nation. It would look good for them to, to have this big country join up. Um, Barton learns about the Red Cross, is astounded by what it's up to, by what it does in Europe. She sees it firsthand in the Franco-Prussian War. She goes to Europe and finds herself in the midst of another war. Um, and so she recognizes that when she comes back to the United States in the 1870s, she is going to embark on a kind of a public education campaign about what the Red Cross is, what it does, the values uh, that it uh, exacts, um, and, and the good that it does for people. Uh, and so, again, this is kind of another one of her campaigns where she puts herself out there, um, is that she goes before Congress, she essentially lobbies for the United States to become part of the, uh, of the organization. And in 1881, is successful um, in getting James, uh, James Garfield um, and that administration on board. Um, and so, then from that point forward, then Barton is in charge of that organization, its missions, where it's going. She takes the Red Cross out of war work, which up until the 1880s, the Red Cross did not deal with humanitarian disasters like, uh, like hurricanes, storms, fires, earthquakes. They only dealt in war, um, which to be fair, in those years in which it was founded, Europe was engaged in war all the time. Um, and so, um, the American Amendment is passed um, with her push within the Red Cross to get them into disaster response. And so it's, it's her role in pushing that, um, again, kind of using some of, really some of these skills that she has as a, as a lobbyist within that organization, but also some of the other skills she learns in the Missing Soldiers Office. And she goes out with the Red Cross to places like Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in the aftermath of the flood there in 1989. Um, 
she's in Galveston, Texas, in the aftermath of the hurricane uh, in 1900. She was in Havana, Cuba, the day that the USS Maine exploded, launching us into the Spanish-American War. I like to say that Clara Bart is everywhere you never want to be. Um, because, and it's very true. She took the Red Cross and really made it into the organization that we know it today worldwide. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened without the experience that she gains right here. With these years, uh, specifically 1865 to 1868, are really the forgotten years uh, when it comes to Barton. Uh, but this is really the most influential time period in her life, driving her uh, full time into the humanitarian trade and, and helping others as a job, finding other organizations and creating them to help others. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.